Hey guys, this is the first time I'm doing the intro on a video. Uh, I'm getting ready to interview Alex Sandman of uh, Peepers. You all know I did the Dallas uh, live event. I interviewed him and a few other people and the quality wasn't great. So we decided to redo this. I absolutely love him. He is one of those people that is so incredibly funny and genuine and has incredible stories and an incredible brand. So you can see I'm wearing his glasses right now. A lot of you sell peepers, but this is a great insight to what it takes to uh, build this brand and also where it came from. It's a fourth generation family business. So I can't wait for you to hear this. So without further ado, here's Alex Sammon of Peepers. Alec, welcome to the Retail for Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to do this. I, second time. I know. Second. For those who, who, I mean, people saw it, us do it live, but for those of you who are listening that weren't, um, a bit, uh, weren't aware, we did a live podcast event in Dallas. You were one of my interviews. I, I swear I will tell you right now, you and Nora are my two favorite people literally on earth. Like, oh. like so friendly, like so smart, so funny. Like it was such a great conversation. And because it was only 30 minutes, I'm like, I got to have you come on the thing. And I'm so glad that you're here now. So now it's like, there's no time, no time. Not that we're going to go two hours, but you know, there's no, there's not like, okay, 30 minutes. You got to be off the stage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. No, I'm super excited. Your family, it's a fourth generation family owned business, correct? Of Peepers. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yep. Fourth generation. We, so my sister and I, we bought it in 2012 uh, for my father, who is right there. He comes into the office literally yes. every day. Turn the camera. Uh, yes. He is. No, he's not. He's a, not in the room. He's not okay. in the room. So yeah, but he is literally on the other side of that wall. Um, and we actually had to do extra soundproofing between the walls because I am so loud and I'm always on the phone. He was like, I, I can't handle it. Um, but anyway, um, but yes, we, so uh, like stepping back, um, I joined the business in 2008, uh, or 2010, my sister joined in 2008. Um, but before that we, in, my sister and I, we both graduated from Indiana university and my dad, like the family rule was if you were going to get involved in the family business, you had to work at least five years for another company to then bring, you know, expertise, knowledge, um, anything that, that could make an impact to the business. Uh, that's what he wanted to do. So he wanted to make sure that we could bring something to the business and not just walk right out of college, right into the family business. So that was, um, and that's where, yeah, that's like, that's, that's essentially, I, I went to a company called CDW, which was a technology sales company. I worked there from the year 2000 through 2000 and just January of 2010. Um, and I, I, I was, I hated sales. Like or I initially thought I hated sales. I was like, oh my God, I would stress out. I remember having to let, I mean, CDW was like dollar for dollars. It was inside sales. You got a headset on, you've got, I mean, you're just literally dialing for dollars. You had to make a hundred calls a day. You had to be on the phone for four hours a day and they would measure that. Like every day you get a report of, oh, Alec only made 86 calls. Um, but so, it, but it instilled this discipline in me and it was and it was i mean you saw where your sales were they ranked you against your class um you know two years after i joined cdw there was only two people left in the sales role and there was 54 of us that started wow two people in after two years and i was one of them so it was so i learned i had a natural or not natural i just liked people i liked connecting with people i liked talking to people um, interacting with them. And so I just, um, found myself excelling at that role. And so I played a number of different roles and then it finally was, you know, it's, it was a fortune, a fortune 500 company. It was massive. And I remember getting my quota in 2009 and, and it was, the quota was just massive. And I was just like, this doesn't make any sense. Someone explained to me, how you want me to grow my territory by 30 X percent. And it was, you know, the CEO was talking to the street and the street was expecting maybe four or 5% growth. And then it would go to the VPs and the VPs are like, we should up that. We should up it to like 8%. I'm like, okay. And then it would get to a director level. And they're like, let's up it to 14. And then by the time it got to me, the person that's actually selling it, my goal would be 30%. And I just was like, you know what? I think I'm going to, if I'm going to work my ass off, I'm going to work my ass off for my family. So 
and that essentially started the movement of me walking away from CDW and 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 you know starting the path to joining Peepers. I have to ask, what were you because I didn't ask this when we were there, and I know it's in the financial world, but kind of explain what you were selling because I, I think sales in general are are challenging unless you're like a natural person, you just have this gift of gab and. But I think if you are picking up a phone and having to cold call, I can't, Mm -hmm. like, there's no way. I can't even, I know. Like, if you told me you had, like, I'm a natural salesperson when I'm working, doing something I love, merchandising. I always get asked, like, can you help me with this? I'm like, yeah. But if you stuck me in a store and you said, okay, here you go, you're going to sell from nine to five, like, I would be like the most awkward, like, hi, how are you? (laughs) Let me know if you need any help. Um, I, I think, so it was, I, CDW sold, we had, I, I want to say it was something around two to 3,000 different vendors or manufacturers. And then within those manufacturers, so like think of um, Hewlett Packard, um, uh, Cisco, which is like all networking equipment, IBM, uh, we had all of those kind of main players that we would, and Microsoft, Microsoft was a huge partner of ours. So we would go in and sell Microsoft software. And then we had a services arm that would help implement the technology within these. I mean, I was dealing with much like big companies. Um, we had, I, so at the end of my career, I was selling into the, the financial vertical downtown Chicago. So I had Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is like one of the biggest clearing houses in the world um, uh, or exchanges in the world. Then I had Citadel Investments, which is one of the largest hedge funds yeah, in the world. So no. they, they would, they would change out a server if they could get like one millisecond faster transactions because they could process transactions that much quicker. That meant millions of dollars for them, you know, every year over year. So the the conversations always were different depending on what was important for that customer. And I would have like engineers that I would bring along with me to my sales meeting. So at the end of the day, I would, I would help I would help people understand the value that I could bring to the to the table from my company's perspective. And then depending on what, you know, whatever area of business that we were talking about, I would bring a subject matter expert, whether it was like a network engineer or a server engineer or a software engineer. And I would bring them to the conversation. And essentially I became like a big, I became a project manager. Like I would just make sure, okay, like they're, I'm documenting down what's being discussed what are the next steps? What are the action items I need to take? And just, you know, I would just kind of manage the project as it, as it, as it, as it moved down the road. And then I would, I would, I would capture whatever sales I could. So, um, why that is very helpful to what you're doing now. Yeah. I mean, so I, what was huge about working with all of these large companies and small companies is I got to learn how big businesses would, like how the procurement process worked. I got to understand what technology they adopted that make them that made themselves more efficient. I got to understand reporting structures, organizational charts, well, how departments were structured. I so when I got to Peepers, I mean I was seven, I was number seven employee. Like we were small. I mean, so I went from like huge, huge, huge to I mean, our, our, our controller, our accountant at the time, I mean, we were still managing our books on paper. We didn't even have QuickBooks, like for real. Like I would, I would ask my dad, I'm like, so how much, I mean, so we have how much in the checking account? He's like, oh, we got this much. And, and I'm like, but how much do you know of that is already like deployed? Like, it's like checks are out there. They need to be cleared. Like how much true cash do we have? And he's like, I don't, you know, maybe Di, maybe Di knows Diane. And I'm like, I, she does it. She doesn't. Like, I'm like, well, so it was, I, I remember so it was week one when I joined the company. And this is not a, a week one, my dad, I mean, we were, again, we were a small company. He was going on a cruise with my mom. And, uh, and he was like, I was sitting there and he, and he writes out a check for $50,000 and he gives it to Diane. And he goes, just, you know, in case we can't make payroll or whatever, just go ahead and cash this. And and I'm just like, what the fuck did I just get myself into? Like, what what just happened? I would, I still remember this. Too. I was just like, wait. And I go, Diane, is that a regular occurrence? She's like, yeah, I've never, I've never, I've had to cash it once in like the last 20 years. I'm like, <laughs> um, so that was, so that was eye opening. Um, I mean, we, we, I still remember, I mean, this is probably TMI, but we had 14,000 
town when I joined the company. I mean, I was, and I just, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just gone. It's just grown and, and changed and evolved so much from when I first joined. Um, but those are like, those are core memories that I remember. I had just brought a newborn into the world. I had just moved my family here. And I remember as I like, I just, it's shocking because I joined the company and my sister and I had to figure out, could we work together before we bought the company? So like I, I had intelligence of like, what is this company really like, like how much, you know, how much cash, like how stable is it? Um, and so I just learned along the way. I mean, there's so many small businesses out there that I know operate in this manner. Yes. And it's just a, so I just started putting together things that just would help me sleep at night, you know, like QuickBooks, like just help me understand what, how much cash do we have on hand? What's our outstanding receivables? What's, you know, just those little things um, that, that I was accustomed to, to knowing, um, about, or at least I thought that it was intuitive for me to know about. And so I just, um, yeah. And then it just slowly started to evolve, but this is where, you know, um, this is where, you know, how different people run their businesses is just, you know, my dad had been doing this for, you know, decades. He was comfortable with this. Like he was comfortable, you know, taking money out of the business and, and being fine with it. And if he had to reinvest, he would reinvest. No problem. No questions asked. Um, you know, bringing me in, was a big step for him, uh, you know, because I I was I was doing pretty well at CDW. I took a massive pay pay cut to come in, but that was a choice I decided to make for uh, my my lifestyle. I wanted to get out of Chicago. I wanted to be a little bit more in the burbs. Um, I, um, you know, I, again, as I said before, if I was working my ass off, I wanted to work for my family. So. Um, that's the, you know, all those decisions came along with, you know, a, a pretty massive pay cut, but it was, but he was making, from his perspective, he was making an investment in like, okay, like, I think this is the right thing to do to grow the business, um, and to keep it within the family. So I think that was, that, that was super important to him. I, um, want to go back to how the company started because when you shared it, like we've talked several times and the first time we talked, you pulled out this. Is what your grandfather, your great grandfather yeah. sold. And I was like, what? Wait, where did, where did you? So let's go back a little bit to like where, because I mean, I think it's fascinating yeah. for companies that truly have been fourth, fifth, six generations and what it yeah. started out and then what it ended up being. I mean, it's, it's, 100%. it's amazing to me. So start off like how the start, this company started. No, that's a, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I remember we were on stage. You're like, whoa, you're throwing me for a loop. Like, oh, what? what? <laughs> um, so my, so it started back in the early 1900s. I, I believe it's like 1904 is when we first, you know, at least, you know, that's when the business quote unquote started. It was my great, great grandfather. Uh, he, no, great grandfather. He started a company in San Francisco. It was originally in San Francisco and it was a screen cloth company. And back then they were exporting it to Japan and they were exporting it to Japan because malaria, it was like, there was a massive outbreak of malaria and it was mosquitoes. And so they were selling the screen cloth to protect people as they slept. And so that was that. And then they, he actually ended up moving because it was during, I want to say like what there was a great, there was a fire in San Francisco, San Francisco, like a mat, like it literally like the entire, that, you know, two or something. Uh, I, made, I, yeah. I and so, <laughs> so that happened and he, to keep the business going, he moved to Kobe, Japan. Like, so he, he like literally moved and lived in Kobe, Japan Right. And it was selling screen cloth. And then it's not really so clear, like how the evolution started. And eventually he moved back to New York. And then my, um, and then my grandfather was, was part of the business. He ended up moving to Chicago. My dad was born. My dad was born in Chicago, but then they started at some point, they shifted to scissors. Um, they were, they were importing and distributing scissors. They were making their scissors out of Italy, believe it or not. It was all manufactured in Italy, imported into the U S and we, we were, at, we were distributing to drugstores, pharmacies, you name it. Um, Walgreens was one of our accounts back in the day when Walgreens was much smaller, but it still is kind of cool. Um, I still, I actually remember the day my dad lost that account. I'll never forget that. But anyway, so, but you know, so this was, 
Um, so scissors were when I was growing up as a kid, scissors was our business. Um, and, and then as seamstresses and, and, and the need for scissors just slowly as manufacturing started to slowly shift to Asia and overseas, you know, scissor sales just started to drop. And so we had to pivot. And so it wasn't until it was 1985. There's a company here in Michigan city, Indiana, that we had a mutual accountant and he, it was a company that was called C8 opticals. I wear accessories, repair kits, and um, some ugly reading glasses. And my dad was around 40 at the time. And he was like, this could be a good bolt-on product for us to sell along with our scissors into the pharmacies and drugstores. And so we, we, he bought the company. Again, it was fairly small and, uh, and bolted it on and it worked. And it was, it, it, it was, you know, he used both of those products to help diversify the falling sales and, and, and scissors. And, um, but it wasn't until my mom. So my mom, she started to need reading glasses in like 92, 93. And she was like, Paul, like these glasses are hideous. Like these are, these are, these are gross. Like I want something fun. And my dad was like, Hey, Terry, you know, uh, whatever, wh- you know, let, let's work with our factories and see what they can come up with. And so she was like, well, I've got some design ideas and, and she's like, and he's like, great, send them to me. And we, and they got some samples from our factories. Um, it was one frame shape. They did like five or six different, you know, fun colorways. And we got the samples. And my my dad, Paul, he said, sure, no, Terry. Like, these, these are crazy. Like, these are nuts. Like, we're not going to sell these. And she's like, I absolutely love them. And I'm going to take them. If that's okay, I'll take the samples. She's, she, he's like, whatever. So he started wash. She started to go to, you know, to grocery stores, church, wherever. And literally it was like, where'd you get those glasses? Where'd you get those glasses? And so she's like, I, I think we, we should test this. We should go to, so Chicago merchandise, merchandise Mart was right in our backyard. Be back then. That was like the Atlanta of the world. Yeah. Like that was the show. Um, and so they took $5,000. My mom took her friend. um, oh God, Elaine Cardoza, I think is her name. I'm pretty sure took her and she was just there for moral support. My mom really had no idea what she was doing. She had one frame shaped five colorways. She had like a tablecloth that had no branding. And she was like, our name is peepers, I guess. Oh, I love it. Like we're peepers from this, from this, from that song, like jeepers, peepers, where'd you get your peep? So that's where she got the name. Um, <laughs> I don't you didn't mention that song. See, yeah, yeah. I love the Straight line. up came from that song. And she, so like they, the, for the first half of the first day, you know, people are like, wow, these are great. These are awesome. Like, how are you selling them? And they're like, I don't, I don't know. Like, how do you, what do you want to, I think she was selling them for like five bucks. Maybe, maybe it was even less than that. And she was just like, how do you want to buy them? And they're like, I don't know. How should, how do you want to package them? Then they went to lunch and I go, well, who's manning the booth when you guys went to lunch? (laughs) And she goes, she goes, we had already hired a independent rep. And so she was managing the, and I go, in literally three or four hours, you had an independent rep that literally was like, I could sell these. And you're like, I trust you. We're going to go to lunch. That's what they did. And then they came back. This is, you can't make this shit up. Then they came back and Elaine Cardoza was like, I think we should sell them as a pack. Like you've got to buy all five and you've got to buy all the strengths. And it'd be like, you know, 350 bucks or whatever it was. And yeah. I was like, hey, that's- I think that's a great idea. And then, so over the next couple of days, they sold over 35 grand worth of, you know, $5 readers. And she came back. She's like, Paul, oh, I think we've got something. So that's that, like, <laughs> oh, holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, oh, wow. Um, and I do, I just, you know, as a kid growing up, I mean, in, in a, in a family business, I do. I mean, I, like I said, I remember, I remember the day he lost the Walgreens account with scissors and I just remember, I you know, like the stress, like money, just like how how you can just they would never talk about it in front of my, my sister and I, but you could just feel the stress, like you could you could understand that things, you know, at, you know, for most of my childhood, I can remember things going great, and then I remember like, okay, things are getting weird, uh, um, and then when people started taking off, you could just feel like this relief. Is it was just it's so funny how 
he's just talking about it right now is making me kind of like relive some of those memories. But um, I mean, that stress of losing an account like that, I think any rep, anybody in manufacturing, yeah. anybody understands that stress of like, oh, fuck, like. Yes. I mean, and it, it may be the most pain in the ass account you have on earth and it's, but it, it, it pays the bills and all of a sudden it's gone. Yes. It's like, oh shit. Like, yeah, yeah, it was. Um, but then, I mean, so, so business started to, uh, to, to take off. My dad was so much more of a technology person. Um, wasn't, he would, he wouldn't go to the shows. Like he, the independent reps that we that we were able to gain at, at those first couple of shows really helped kind of started to, you know, allow the market and the wholesale market to take off. Um, but uh, I mean, he really relied on the reps to do their job, but he wouldn't go to the shows. And so he was more of an introvert and like technology guy. Um, but he is, uh, but that's when, I mean, he launched peeperspecs.com now we're peepers.com, but he launched a website in 1996. So we were, I mean, you know, the brand had started and we started to gain market share from a wholesale perspective. And then he launched online. Um, and it was, and when I started with the company in 2010, 80% of our sales were online direct to consumer 20%. I mean, we were getting our ass handed to us by a number of competitors in the wholesale market. Um, and it was just, you know, my dad was comfortable. Like he, he wasn't the type who was like, okay, we let's scale this. Let's grow this. Let's, you know, he was like, Hey, this is a very comfortable like place that we're living in. I don't need to go nuts. I've got a good life. Um, and that was his sort of mentality. Um, and, but mine was definitely different when I came into the business. Um, I wanted to from that, that place of paper, everything on paper to, you know, modernizing it and making it more of a, a, an actual, I mean, it was an actual working company, but where it was legitimate in, in regards of being on paper, are you frozen? You are my editing team. There you are. Oh, no, you're not. No, you're, no, you're not. Well, it's nasty. Um, but your dad really, I mean, like, Really, I mean, it, it seems like he took it r- really to the next level as far as with you know mm-hmm. and online and 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 then you coming in and then really getting it dialed in from being on paper and e- you have to tell the story, <laughs> the accounting story of the employee because that still is my favorite story ever. <laughs> um, yeah, that goes back to as I was digging into the business. So when. We had, uh, as I was trying to get an understanding of what our wholesale, when I joined the business, I, 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 I was getting to know the product. I was getting to know the landscape of where we were selling and I was that were selling our products. Um, and then I knew, you know, we weren't in some major markets. Um, but I remember, so, you know, we're paying commissions to these people and we had a lot of, uh, a lot of legacy sales reps that were out there still selling, but there were, there was, um, there's actually two instances where the IRS contacted us and they're like, Hey, uh, we're looking for your help. And we're like, okay, how can we help you IRS? Um, they're like, well, you keep paying this person and, and it's a 1099. Like you say that you keep on paying these people, but we can't, we can't get in contact with them. And we're, we're wondering if you can help us get in contact with these people. We're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. So we were looking at the books and I was like, die, like die actually made a couple of phone calls. We ended up finding out the sales reps were dead. Like literally they had passed away, gone, seriously gone. And I was like, Holy shit, die. How long have we been paying them? It was like autopilot. It was just auto. So as you opened up an account as a sales rep, you were on that account. And if they kept on reordering, we would just keep on sending commission, which is, I mean, I mean, sales reps, like they, that's great. They love that. But then when they stop cashing those checks, I'll go, well, can you see if they've been cashing the checks? Yeah. The last like three or four checks, none of them had been cashed. I mean, like, and I'm like, oh my God, this is actually one. There was almost, almost 13 checks that hadn't been cashed. So she had been gone. There was no red flag at all that this extra cash. Apparently not. not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Apparently not, Michelle. So yeah, those are, but I will say like, so yeah, in a lot of ways, the business was on autopilot, but it was, 
it, so I, I I tell a story of when I when my dad started to get involved with the family business. So this is in the early seventies, and my dad was a pilot for TWA. My mom was a flight attendant. That's how they met. That's how I arrived. Um, and but he was a pilot. That's what he loved to do. He he flew for the Navy, did two tours in Vietnam, then flew for TWA. And when his dad, my grandfather, said, you know, hey, would you want to get involved with the business? And he, uh, there was a point in time where TWA allowed pilots or they, they went on furlough. And so, which is basically like leave of absence or whatever, they didn't have as much work to do. So he's like, okay, I'll get involved with the family business. And so he started to work with my dad but my or my grandfather and his dad. And it was... He was trying to implement technology. IBM had just like started, like you know, they had the uh, they had launched a, um, PCs or servers, and so he was like, "How can we incorporate this into the business?" He was just trying to put his spit on it, and his his dad was like, "You know what, Paul? If it's not broken, we're not going to fix it. So let's not let's not innovate. Okay, let's great. not do." Yeah. And so and so all of the ideas that my dad was bringing to the table would would just immediately get shot down, and he was just like this sucks. Like, I'm going to go back to flying. If this is the way that you want to run your business and I'm not going to be able to add any value or, or you're not going to take my input seriously, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to go back to flying. So he did. So he's like, he literally hopped on a flight back to Kansas city. That's where the hub was for TWA. He was going to go back to flying. And on that flight home, his, he lands. And my mom at the time, they, she calls him, uh, and she's like, you're not going to believe this, but your dad just passed away. So after that fight, his dad had a heart attack and he was oh. in this office, in this, in this very office, not like in this very space, but in this building where I'm at right now, he had a heart attack and he drove himself to the Michigan city hospital and he died at that hospital. So I say that, but I, it's crazy the history that's in this building, but it was, that was the aha moment where my dad said, you know, to, to both Lindsay and myself, whatever you guys want to do to make this business, what you want it, like I will support you. So it was in a lot of ways, he was a huge catalyst. I didn't have to fight him, you know, like I didn't have to fight for the thing that I wanted to change. I didn't have to, you know, as, as I was evaluating our competition and, you know, we were selling all of our products at different wholesale price points. I don't know why, but that's what we were doing. And I was like, we need to, we need to just make all of our wholesale price points the same price. We need, I mean, like all these little things, he's like, don't do it. Okay, great. How can I support you? We were on an IBM AS400, was just like the matrix. It's like a green screen of death, like to train people on it. Just trying to get information out of it. It was bulletproof, but that's because no one knew how to hack it. No one, no one wanted to hack it. It was so we we moved to like PC based software. So like you know, as we were as we were growing, we could onboard people and train them. Um, he was hugely supportive in that. Like there were so many things um, that that he just he was like, yes, like let's go, um, and that's what allowed us to change and pivot and innovate and just. And and then start to really compete um, with the players on the wholesale side, but also really bring new stuff to our to our to our online space, to our direct to consumer business. So in a lot of ways, like he was a multi channel business before it was cool to be a multi channel business, or even before brands knew that that was something that they had to do to be able to grow and compete. And so that's where I think you know. And I just naturally just stepped into, okay, I have to think as a leader of this business, how can I support both? Like, how can I fuel both engines so that I can meet the customer where they want to be met, where they want to shop? And so that was, those were things that I just, um, I stepped into, but then I just fostered and, and just, and, and wanted to grow. But in a lot of ways, I mean, we run two different businesses. We have to think about who we're, how we're talking to those types of consumers. One is buying for a store and and needs to turn, and one is buying one to two pairs. And so, how do we how do we have those conversations and and excite the customers to want to you know to to want to bring the product? But they both fuel each other. I mean, it's like it's customers want to try on eyewear. I mean, it's just natural. We're in seven thousand accounts nationwide. I mean, people like to type in their zip code and go to their store, their local store, shop local, 
buy the products. Um, but there's sometimes retailers don't have the product and so, or the strength. Yeah. And so sometimes people are like, okay, for ease of, you know, they'll, for, for the ease of it, they, they may buy the product direct from us, but it's a, but man, I mean, it's just, you know, it reinforces the brand wherever customers are seeing the Peepers brand. It's um, it just reinforces it. And, and we're just, we're so careful about where we place the brand we're not going to Walmart. We're not going to Target. We are so focused on growing and defending the gift channel. I mean, that is that is literally like I love. That's, that's one of we have like three core growth drivers, and the top the top one is grow and defend gift. I mean, it's just that's that's where we are. So I hope anyone listening, we that's where we're staying. That's where our allegiance is. We are. Um, yeah, I, I I think that's just something that's just I mean, a core it's value. A perfect fit for because I you know I I think I told you I with my retail consulting, I will consult like I've consulted a pharmacy a five storage pharmacy chain for years, and when we brought you in, I mean it was like I I forget what other line you know everyone's got the shitty Foster Grant sorry Foster Grant but you know everyone has those inexpensive you know just for you know grandma to pick it up on her way but yeah. when we brought those in it was like this breath of fresh air and it was like I could not believe how fast thing how fast we were selling out of things and like we we tested it in lower volume pharmacies and we mm. just like you know make a small little selection and yeah, uh, it was insane how like even with like maybe 10 people a day that came in that pharmacy, like how many walked out with those glasses? I mean, it was so it was amazing. I, I, I have to say, going back to your dad, I love that how open minded he was to change because I talk about it a lot on the podcast that I think a lot of owners get so hung up on the way the way we used to do it. This is the way we've always done it. It's yeah. not, if it's not yeah. working, we're not going to, and, and it stops them from growing and from right. morphing into a bigger, better version of what, right. they, because they're so stuck on, this is the way we've always done. It. And then if they do give up the reins yeah. that they micromanage the fuck out of it. And it's like, yeah, Totally. giving the creativity the person like really it's going to expand and level up your business and it i love that your dad did that because that's very very rare i mean i worked for a couple people that have and they're that have walked into their not walked in but have assumed their parents roles and taking on their business and growing it and it's funny to watch the, the in the beginning the the resistance and then when they finally start seeing some change and like then it's like let it go. And it's like, it just morphs into this insane thing that way beyond yeah. what everybody thought it was going to be. Yeah. I, it is, uh, you know, I think I, we wouldn't be where, where we're at today if it wasn't because of the, that sort of relationship that my dad fostered with my sister and I, I mean, it's just point blank. There's no way we'd be able to change and adapt. And they, they, they call me, um, AOC, uh, that's my nickname, Agent of Change. Um, it's just constantly so we we have a lot of different things within the business now that I've wanted to continue to foster. We have the big idea every month. I there's a there's a board. We use this um, a platform called Teams, and anyone can submit an idea. Um, and then I just ask them to you know just to where on the values does that actually like lean into. Um, if they do submit an idea, but like we've gotten so many good ideas from our team uh, and it makes sense we implement it and we pay them for it. Like we literally give them like a bonus. We're like, Hey, if we select your idea to be the big idea, like you're going to, we're going to fucking give you some money for it because like, I, I want your ideas. I want like that. the next idea of the team that's out there right now could be the next thing that takes us to the next level. It's like, I, I, and, and they're so, you know, all the different roles that people play within the organization. It's just, these are the things that, um, I don't want them to ever hold back. I want us to constantly innovate. So I'm a sense of ownership. I mean, yes. that's the biggest thing yeah. they're, they're, their input is wanted. It's, it's, right. it's, it's thanked monetary, monetize like monetarily. Yeah. It's, 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 it, I mean, it's like, what, amazing company culture you have built because that that 
That is very rare. And the, and the fact that you open it up and pay them for it. And, and I mean, I would be, yeah. I can only imagine like your turnover is very low, I'm assuming. We do not have a lot of turnover. We were just, uh, we just got named, yeah, best places to work in Indiana for the eighth year in a row. So yeah, I mean, it's something that we, we just, yeah, I mean, it, culture is, I don't, I think you can tell by my personality. I don't take myself too seriously. I like to laugh. I like to have a good time. Um, but I mean, we work our ass off. I've surrounded myself with people that want to win. Um, period. They do. They, they want to win. Our, I always say this, but my, my senior e-commerce manager, her name's Ariel. And like when we're in meetings together, she's just like, it sucks to suck. So let's not suck, please. <laughs> That's not, right. like it sucks, it, sucks. Not suck. it sucks to suck. Let's not suck. I'm like, I agree. Like it's a, I mean, that's the sort of mentality that we take. And it's also, and you empower when you can empower your team, our customer experience team, they, they have the power to do whatever it takes to take care of the customer. You will never. And if, if, if there are a customer that's listening and they've never done this, I want to know, but they, you should never have to hear I need to talk to my manager. Hang on real quick. There's never like they do have the power to take care of you. Our plot, whatever it is. Uh, we we joke around that there's no crying in peepers because I don't want ever a customer that's upset about whatever potentially may be going on, it, whether it's in our control or not. Um, I don't want them to get, you know, our team so upset where because they're trying to protect a policy or whatever. I'm like, just take care of the customer. Like literally just take care of the customer and our customers, they're, they're, they're our reps. They are our actual customers. They're vendors of ours that help support us. Like all of those, that ecosystem that, you know, creates the value and creates just, you know, the brand itself. I mean, there are, there are times where customers will buy a product from a retailer in North Carolina and they call up because the, maybe the product, maybe a temple fell off. I mean, things do happen. And we just take care of the customer. We don't ask them, oh, you might want to contact the retailer in North Carolina and, and then they can execute the return and then we can process the exchange. No, it's we just take care of the customer. And so that value that customers get by just the simplicity of it, we stand behind the product, we're a family run company. It's just, and I don't know, like, That's and if you have a the culture... That, yeah. that I just the company culture right now, and this is another thing, by the way, everybody, we did not talk about on the podcast, at the live at all about your company culture, which I, I mean, yeah. and that's another reason why I'm glad we're doing this because you, I, the listeners get so much more out of these conversations because they just like just unfold, and and it, it's. It's amazing. Okay, before, because I, we're going heading into an hour and we don't have time restraints on this, but I, I am respectful of your time. But two things. Congratulations yeah. on being Oprah's pick multiple oh, years ago, which is, you know, that to me is like the Academy Award for for being recognized by her. So congratulate on that. Like, ha talk a little bit Thank about you. what it's like to... Yeah, you know, without divulging too much, what it's like to create something for Madame O. Yeah, that is, um, that's a really, it is, it is the first year that we were able to get on that list. I mean, it is, it is such a huge brand accolade that that does, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, there's, I forget there was a story that she shared or maybe the Hearst had done an article of like how many millionaires Oprah has made in the United States because of her just brand support of, of these small businesses. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, what, putting her name behind something does, uh, it does carry a ton of weight. Um, you know, meeting, you know, this is back in the day, uh, going to trade shows. I didn't know that she had scouts, you know, that were out there. Um, and Adam Glassman, Ran Herman are her, Adam is the creative director of, uh, O, um, and, uh, not O magazine, but, uh, Oprah Daily is now the name of it. And, uh, and Rayanne is, is his sidekick that, uh, that manages, I mean, I, her whole role, for the majority of the year is managing like the O list, like call like finding vendors and Adam is too, but it's such a, yeah. I mean, her job is just, it's, I mean, the amount of people that she has to talk to and the amount of stuff that gets sent to her, I can't even imagine, but it's, uh, it is, you know, the first time I think I shared this, the first time that we were in O, o magazine, 
it was uh, it was a display product. Like he was just like, hey, Gail King would actually love this. And I'm like, Adam, we don't sell this. And he's like, but I was like, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> so, I mean, we just, you just kind of have to pivot and do those sorts of things. And it, we just started to form a relationship. And, you know, it's um, having people like, like Adam and Rand, having people like even Tori Johnson from Good Morning America, having those types of people that you can cultivate relationships and and it allows you to put your brand brand on a platform and get it into in in, in front of so many new eyeballs. It is um yeah, I mean those are those are things that really can catapult a brand and really and that drove a ton of momentum um within the company. There's no question. And I'll forever be grateful. What is it like when, because I always wondered this, like the, the list comes out because I know as a buyer for for the pharmacies, like I would look for the list at Christmas time and how many of the items that I chose that ended up on that list because it was like, yes. And then we can kind of capitalize on that and say, as seen in Oprah. Sure. What is it like when that comes out? Is it just like a flood of calls for that one pair of glasses? And it's like, because I, I can't even imagine yeah. when the magazine goes out. Yeah. So it is November 1st. They'll usually kick it off. Uh, it's usually either it's, it's usually November 1st is when they will, they'll do the big press event. They'll first launch it on Good Morning America with Tori Johnson. Um, so they'll, that's like their first big event. Uh, and then, and then Amazon will also have a big event because they want, they, again, this is all about like meeting a customer where they want, you know, where they can easily shop sometimes when they can't get to the retailers. But then we'll do a big event with all of our, um, with all of our wholesale reps pushing the product. Um, we do direct to consumer mailings to, I mean, we do, we do a ton of our own advertising to help, you know, to help just allow people to, to understand that, Hey, this is a new collection that we're launching. Um, and be that it's, yeah, that we've made the list again. And so it's a, a, but yes, on launch date. Yes. It's a, it's a, we, we prepare, you have to be prepared. Like you have to prep for all of that. Um, so it's a, it is a big, it's a big, I it's a big event. Imagine, Cause I, I know I, <laughs> and I get so excited and it's like, oh yes, we picked it and it was on, <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about also fashion and how you get the sun. Yeah. I'm wearing the pair that I love that is half gorgeous, half green. And I, yeah. I, I, I know we talked about this at the show about the lady that I love because she drops f bombs so much. The Beth, Beth. Uh, for oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Wait. she's the fitness coach or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So like literally every <laughs> single one of her things. In I know. Wait. Like, like there, that, yeah, she must be in like she, I don't even know how many pairs she has, but I swear to God, I'm like, he's got a lot. She has a lot. <laughs> I know. We actually, I think we actually may have done something with her. I know we've, I know we've sent her a ton of free pairs because I mean, it's like she every post she does, they're like, where'd you get those glasses? And she just comments, and and she's she's probably yeah, she's a very good affiliate sponsor of ours. He's uh, Brad, but uh, the fashion part of it because you know. Uh, for those who know and those who don't, I was at Fred Siegel for years and my b boss, Michael Campbell, had Fred Siegel eyes. And yeah. he sold it to David Gonzalez, who now owns other eyewear glasses. But it was always amazing to me to go in there and see all the fashion of Oliver Peoples and blah, blah. But, the, but none of them were were price points, even with 40% off, that I could afford to buy. So when, as watching readers evolve and then your brand comes up and like all these amazing styles, it's like how, talk a little bit about how you started to do the uh, Mr. Potato Head as you call <laughs> That was, you no, know, that's hilarious. I, joining the, joining the family business, I mean, back in the day, it is, we would get samples for our factories. And I think, I mean, honestly, my mom and dad, they would select what they thought was fun and exciting. And that would enter into the line. I mean, it was a very basic process. And I, and honestly, I think there's still a lot of people that that's, that's how they run their business. You know, I mean, these, these, uh, factories will send them samples. They're like, Oh, that's cool. I think I can sell them. But this is where I remember the first time asking one of our factories, Hey, could I, could I take this frame and let's, and, and, and then can I change the color of this temple to like red and keep this black? 
And I remember and it, 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 we're operating in two different time zones, right? So then I'd have to wait like 12 hours for them to reply. And then they'd be like, and I would wake up in the morning and they'd be like, yeah, hundred percent. What Pantone color do you want? And I'm like, what? I remember like, just like what? Um, <laughs> and that's when I started to play around with designs. Like I would just, I would get creative. I would, um, you know, get inspiration from, from other, you know, brands that were out there. I would, anything that, um, that I thought, could, you know, make us look different and give us a competitive edge, I would design towards. And I mean, I brought way too many new designs every season. Like sometimes I would launch a hundred new designs at a market and customers are like, what? Like, yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Our display only holds 30. Like, what are you doing? And I'm, and so I, I definitely, I mean, I learned over the years. Now we have a very buttoned up merchandising and design team. Like they, they're so much smarter than I ever was. And they, and we, and the relationships that they have with our factories, but we also, we just got back from Mido, which is a, it's one of the largest optical shows in the world. It's in Milan, Italy. And our design team went, our production team went, I went. And so we're having different meetings, but our team will go out and trend. I mean, they'll, they'll go to the shows, they'll get inspiration from there, but then they'll shop. I mean, they literally go out and shop in Milan and and just get inspiration of what they're seeing and it's not necessarily eyewear like they're just looking for you know just like what 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 colors are trending what fabrics are trending what textures are trending um merchandising ideas like you know i mean what you do like how are how are stores presenting you know things in innovative fun ways that we could potentially bring to our our wholesalers um that is so important. I mean, that is so. Yeah. It is so. I mean, since COVID is like finally just like behind us. I mean, this these are the things that we're now you know back to being able to do. We do. Um, I'm sure. I mean, WGSN is a trending service that we subscribe to. That's where. I mean, we get a ton of innovation, and um, because we're designing right now, the team is working on spring 25. So we've already like fall 24 is already baked. It's already done. Like we're already on spring 25. So this is. They need these sorts of services to to help us understand like what is going on from a macro yep. perspective that we can then design into it. I mean, some of the trends are, I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, what we're what we're seeing, um, you know, it's like all of this consumption came out of the pandemic. Like people were just consuming things to make themselves feel better. We have nothing else to do. We're just gonna consume, consume. And there's this like sentiment of People are, um, and I hate to say this, I don't want it, but it's like, they're retracting. They're like, okay, like I need to like decompress for a little bit. Um, it's just an interesting thought that we're, we're seeing kind of enter into the buyer's behavior. Like people are just, they're finding new ways to fill their cup and it's not necessarily just going out and just buying, 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 buying. So, um, so it's just like, so how do we design into that? Like, is, is it more, are we going to design more like, you know, um, elevated basics, elevated class, like things that people can, you know, if they're not going to, you know, consume so much, like how can they use, you know, a frame in a multitude of different, you know, um, situations, but, you know, papers are price point and our designs. I mean, people love to just, you know, design, or they like to buy. Yeah. To I mean, yeah. I mean, so it's expensive and it's something that yeah. everybody at a certain age is going to need anyway. So you're kind of right. Like, you've got that like built in audience of people who are aging and who like need readers no matter what. But the price, yeah. price points, it's like that's that's what I think is one of the smartest things. It's like it, it enables the consumer to buy instead of just, oh, like for Fred Siegel, it was like, I love these glasses, but there is no way I'm going to be able to spend $350, even if with my 40% right. off and have a pair of yeah. And then P.S., I fucking lose them. I mean, it's like, to be honest. It's like, I know. It, that, that's great for business. And it, right? So, I mean, that's what I love about your, I mean, they're fashion forward. They're at a price point that people can buy three pairs at a time if you want, and you're still under a hundred bucks. And I, I yeah, think that is beautiful place yeah. to be in business is, is something that everyone needs and it's hundred percent bank. 
Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, that that is the, I mean, what we hear from our retailers, and I mean, it's, they buy, they don't just buy one, they'll buy two or three. And it's, um, and that, I mean, yeah, we, we, I mean, you love to hear those sorts of stories. I mean, that's, that's something that, that, um, that we, yeah, we, we hope continues. And, and it is. So what I always ask people, the last couple of questions is, you yeah. have this for a while. What does the next 10 years look like for Alec and for Peepers? That's a really, that's a good question. I mean, we are right now we're finishing up a distribution center expansion. So we're adding on another 32,000 square feet to our, to our building. Uh, we, we need the space, uh, you know, as we've grown and grown just the, you know, both sides of the business in just making sure that we've got enough area to, to do all of the value add that we do for a lot of our wholesalers. Um, but it's a, I mean, another big push of ours is sun. I, so we want to diversify, not just to be a reader company, but also a sun company. So that is something that we are, we're actively pushing and investing and learning more about like what trends go, what, what trends we need to consider all the different price points that we should be considering as we're, as we're pushing our sun, um, product. So that is a, a very, very big push. Um, and then, you know, as we're growing within this community, it's something that, uh, we're just, we're, we are, we're, we're trying to connect with our community more and more. So we're, we've launched this peepers for teachers initiative that, um, a portion of our budget every year goes to teachers. I mean, this is, this is something that, this is something that, and like when we look at who our customers are, I mean, you know, there, but there are so many, there's so many teachers that literally pull out of their own budget to fund school supplies for the thing, the curriculum that they're, that they're being asked to teach in their schools. And so we're like, how can we make an impact from that perspective? We have this massive event before, before teachers go back to school. And it's a huge parking lot party that we put on for all these teachers. And it's gotten so big that we're now having to do time slots because we don't have enough parking. We've got DJs. We allow people to we allow people to pick out all the different pairs of reading glasses and sunglasses for, for you know, to, to, I mean, because it gets kids excited too when their teachers are wearing fun eyewear. Like it just, you know, it oh, just amazing. Yeah. So those are, but we do GoFundMe pages for where custom where teachers can find where they'll say, hey, we need this for our classroom. And we'll just fund the whole thing. It, and it's like 500 bucks, 750 bucks, like those sorts of things. But as the community of employees is growing nationwide too, that allows us to fund all across the nation. So it's a, so those are like, like we're just, we're becoming more of a staple within this community. And we're creating a, like, this is where people want to work um, around here, where we've created a really cool space. We have a gym on site. We were, we're actually, we're building a Peepers Park that's next to our distribution centers. So people can just chill outside. It'll have grills. It'll have like, so it's just, we're trying to create a really cool space that people, A, love to work. B, they're proud to show where they work. They can bring their family members here and they're like, yeah, this is where I fucking work. This is awesome. <laughs> I want people to be proud of where, of who they are and where they spend the majority of our fucking time is here, you know? So it's a, so I want to be proud of what they do. So that's, uh, so all those things of how we connect with, that's what family means to be, you know what I mean? So this is where, um, and if we do all those things and if I keep those team members happy, A, they're going to bring great ideas. They're going to take care of our customers and the customers that do interact with us. They're going to be like, wow, why would I ever buy another pair of reading glasses from anywhere else? Like they, I have such an amazing experience. They bring great product. It's just all like is a full circle moment. So those are, so yeah, that's a long-winded answer of like the next 10 years, but at least that's where my head's at. That is amazing. I mean, I've always said, I mean, it's like, I believe any, any person, any company needs to give back in some way, whether it's time or money or donating clothes or, you know, I mean, my, I, my pet charities, Pugnation, uh, my other company's pet charity is, you know, doing homeless outreach. We'll pack sandwiches for uh, for the homeless and walk, take them through downtown LA. It's like my little small way, but it's like 
something that I, you know, is really important of giving back. And and I think that the best companies are the ones that really invest doing things like that for the community and building community within that from those actions. And it's like, it's, I knew I liked you. I just, I knew it. And see, we didn't even get to talk about this and the, the live either. So it's like, he continued to surprise me. Yeah, I sorry. Yeah, no, but those are those are things we give a day off to every team member. So if those if peepers for teachers is in their jam, like they can use that eight hours and do whatever they want. They can go out and donate that time to clean up the beach or whatever they want to do. Go to an animal shelter, but they can use that time. They also can use that time to, I mean, we put together tools and resources to work on their budget. Like sometimes like calling, you know, a bank uh, to re, you know, especially when mortgage rates were, were lower, but it's like, go refinance your fucking home. Like when uh-huh. rates were Um, go take care of whatever financial things that you need to take care of. Like think about what you're spending on for, um, you know, for TV and internet, like maybe cut the cord, like all these things, like giving them the time, the resources, and we give them tools too of like, Hey, this is how, and we share that. Like we do this monthly huddle where we share these stories with the rest of the company. It's, it's like, Hey, guess what? Kathy just did this and she's saving X amount every week, every month by just calling this company and, and, in and, and, and renegotiating her rate. And it's just trying to do little things like that, that just, you know, can make an impact. Um, cause it doesn't always have to be huge wins. It's like these little small wins that just add up to, um, you know, a positive place. I am so excited for people to hear this interview. And I, I, I know this is going to give so many people so much inspiration to take even just one of these things back to their own company, whether it be promoting their employees' ideas or giving time to go volunteer and do something. I mean, yeah. uh, thank you so much for- oh my, God, my pleasure. Like I just, I every time I get on the phone with you and talk to you, I just, I adore you even more. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was so much fun. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I would, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll come back whenever you want. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh well good luck and uh we'll 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 I'll see you at the shows, I'm assuming. Yes. 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 Okay, cool. Oh,